glad you're here. Well, hey, thanks for sharing those with us guys on a Monday. Those are some fun family traditions. A lot of stuff around Christmas, which is cool. Um, we are going to dive into a story in the life of David. We, today, um, if you have been kind of journeying with us, these are different. So um, we are focusing on um, specific uh, specific narratives within the life of David. And so if you, were, if you studied any of our previous series with us, it's different to study narrative than it is to study those. Um, and so studying narrative means that we focus on different focus points. So exposition, kind of the who, what, where, when of the passage, rising action or tension, climax, falling action or tension, and then resolution. So uh, this document is linked in the post. It's also linked in the comments. You can join it with us, uh, but we will catch you up a little bit. Um, I'll tell you where we were this last weekend, where we've been so far in the life of David. And then um, Lisa will spend some time telling us how we got to here. And then we'll need your help because we really want you guys uh, to actually help us do the study. That's what makes this really fun. So, but before we get started, Lisa, would you pray for us? Yep. Uh, God, we just thank you so much for a new day, a new week, a new month. Um, God, it feels like this month might be a little bit different than the past few. And so God, I just pray that as we uh, begin to go back to some of what uh, was going on before COVID, uh, God, that you would give us wisdom, that you would um, help us to be aware of um, how we're uh, re-entering society and what that looks like. And um, God, that we would not be looking at others and uh, placing judgment on what they are doing or aren't doing. Um, God, that you would just help us to remember all the things that we have learned, um, that we are to love one another, and that that goes beyond sometimes what is comfortable for us. Uh, as we dive in today, I pray that you would just help us to um, have wisdom as we are approaching what is written in um, your word. God, that you would help us to understand um, how this affects our lives today and how uh, we can live out um, through David's example. We love you and pray in Jesus' name. Amen. Amen. All right. So life of David, if uh, you have been with us this whole time, basically David is this uh, young man early in the book. And um, we find that Saul, who was the first king of Israel, because Israel wanted a king like other nations had, uh, he had fallen out of favor because he kept making these compromises. He kept doing things not the way God had asked him to do it. And uh, eventually it was like, all right, I'm moving on. And so then Samuel uh, a relevant name for our study today. The prophet of God anoints David as the next king of Israel. Uh, and then we kind of watch David get closer to Saul because God sends this harmful spirit to Saul. And the only person that can calm him down is David playing his liar. Um, and then they end up uh, fighting the Philistines. Who's going to face Goliath? David shows up to bring supplies to the troops, specifically his brothers. And it says, I'll fight him. Like, let's go. And so he takes down Goliath. Uh, and then over time, we watch Saul get more and more jealous and frustrated with David, uh, the potential threat that he uh, represents to, to his status, to his leadership. Uh, and so he begins trying to kill him. Um, the hard part, right, is that David is married to one of Saul's daughters who helps him escape at one point. He's also super best friends with Saul's son, Jonathan, who helps him escape at one point. He's uh, kind of on the run. We looked at one of two accounts that happens um, in the in 1 Samuel uh, this weekend where David has the chance to take Saul's life. We looked at the one that happened in a cave uh, where David basically just has way more integrity than Saul does and says, even though you would do this to me, I'm not going to do it to you. Even though you're trying to kill me, I'm not going to do it to you. And Saul has this like kind of momentary glimpse of, I'm so sorry, you're going to be king, you're better than I am. Uh, before kind of reverting back. But basically there's, I think it's eight years uh, where, where Dave kind of lives on the run and he's uh, trying to hopefully escape um, Saul trying to get him. And so that was where we were this weekend. Um, and we're going to pick up with David as king um, in this passage. So Lisa, you want to give us a quick rundown on kind of where we've been from this weekend to today in the life of David? Yeah, and I think it's it's interesting that even though Saul kind of recognized uh, who David was going to be, and they had this moment together, David is still on the run. So it's not like they just return together and and you know spend a couple nice years. Um, Saul continues to pursue David, and uh, not in that like tender father in law. Yeah, yes. anyway. 
<laughs> so uh, right after the passage that we studied this weekend, we read about the death of Samuel. So this prophet who had anointed both um, Saul and David dies. And so that's kind of a big thing. David ends up, um, I, I, I've titled this Collecting Wives. So he had been given uh, one of Saul's daughters, Michal, as his wife. Um, interesting, she gets given away to a, a different man um, when David's not home. So that that's kind of, you know, that's weird. Uh, but David starts collecting wives. And so um, in the end of uh, chapter 25 in 1 Samuel, we read about a woman named Abigail. Uh, that he ends up marrying. And then we also read about another woman. I'm not exactly sure how to say her name, but Ahinoam of Jezreel. And so both of these ladies become uh, his wives. And so, you know, that's different. Um, we read again that David is going to spare Saul's life one more time. Um, and then he actually spends some time with the Philistines, which is very interesting. Uh, but then we're going to move on. And um, David has to leave the Philistines. And then we read about the death of Saul. And this is kind of a big thing. Saul is in a battle against the Philistines. Jonathan is with him. Both Jonathan and Saul are killed. Uh, Jonathan is killed by the Philistines. Saul is injured by them, um, but he, he does not want to get captured because he knows if he's captured, that's not going to go well for him. And so he begs his armor bearer to kill him and his armor bearer refuses. And so Saul actually kills himself to describe it, uh, that he falls on his sword. And so um, when we when we end the book of First Samuel, uh, Saul has died, Jonathan is dead, um, and the camp of Israel is just kind of not sure what to do. So we pick up in second Samuel, uh, where David finds out that Saul has been killed and, um, David is distraught. Uh, chapter one, verse 11, uh, it says, then David took hold of his clothes and tore them. And so did all the men who were with him. And they mourned and wept and fasted until evening for Saul and for Jonathan, his son, and for the people of the Lord and for the house of Israel, because they had fallen by the sword. David is not rejoicing. He is not excited about this. He understands that this is a very, very heavy uh, time for him. And although there was all this tension between him and Saul, he also recognized that Saul at one time had been God's chosen king. Um, and so, so that's a big thing for him. Um, we move on in um, chapter two, we find that David is anointed king of Judah. And then we'll move on a little bit further um, in chapter five. And it says David is anointed king of Israel. And so um, there is no doubt any longer who the, who the next king of Israel is. It is David. Um, and so then we're going to pick up here in chapter six, uh, which in my Bible is titled The Ark Brought to Jerusalem. Awesome. Well, thanks for that catch up. Uh, I, I think, you know, when we when we cover that kind of swath of time, I think it's always important for us to talk again about the difference um, between descriptive and prescriptive. Right. So Crystal said uh, it bothers me how women were treated as tradable objects. Absolutely. I mean, it's it's awful. And over and over and over again. Um, God communicates like what marriage is supposed to be being modeled originally in Genesis. Um, be talking about one man, one woman for one lifetime in a covenant with God. Um, and because of the cultures around Israel, because of what was taking place, it was just such an easy, consistent compromise yeah. to fall into the patterns that everybody else had set. Um, and it wasn't usually, it wasn't just wives, right? You had like, uh, I mean, Solomon, uh, descendant of David, he would have even more concubines than wives. So he had just this like massive harem. And it was like, basically God said to him early in his, in his ministry, Hey, don't get mixed up with foreign wives. Like be faithful to the picture that I painted for you of this. And he's like, sounds good. And then just completely ignores. The I wife. read about that today, actually 700 so, wives, 300 concubines, 1000 ladies. Yeah. That's I like, mean, that's great. a lot. That's a lot great. of ladies. But the other thing, Crystal, that I just want to make sure um, this is something that I press into a lot because it's easy to read the Bible with our modern day lens and to make assumptions that this is how God wanted women to be treated. It is absolutely not. Uh, God created men and women in his image. And he, like Phil says all the time, uh, with infinite dignity, value and worth. 
women were precious to God, just as men are precious to God. This is not how God told men to treat women. It is how men through sin and the, um, the exposure to other cultures defined how women would be treated. And so I, I just think, I don't know, I have to press into that because, um, because we read these, we read this with, with an assumption and I just want to kind of break down some of those assumptions. This isn't God, this is man. This is sin and broken man. Right. Absolutely. Yeah. Uh, Crystal said, uh, LOL, the entire town I grew up in had less than a thousand people. <laughs> Well, we, I mean, when we interpret the, the Old Testament through the lens of the New Testament, right, which is a good hermeneutic, if you missed it a few weeks ago, we did a study called How Do I Study the Bible? Mm -hmm. um, we talked about this idea uh, that we want to always be able to interpret, give final interpretation to the New Testament or the Old Testament. And so um, Paul describes men and women as co-heirs of this grace, right? Um, and it was, you know, it was controversial the way that women were esteemed when done appropriately within um, Jewish and Israelite uh, tradition. It was controversial because it was so different than women of surrounding communities. And then thank God that continued in the early church. And by God's grace, it will continue in the church as we move forward. And there are these, uh, you know, these pockets and moments where women are not treated well by people who call themselves Christians. And I think our opportunity is to go back to this is what this is what is true. This is what is correct. How do we make sure that we tr truly do treat everybody with infinite dignity, value, and worth? I mean, not to get too off track, right? But when we when we stop doing that, that's not only when sexism crops up, that's when we continue to see racism crop up. Right. And we're watching it around our country yeah. right now boil over uh, because there is a group of people feeling so scared, so isolated. Um, so what does it look like for us to give value and esteem to one another, recognizing that it's true for all of us? Uh, Carrie said kind of about another uh, deal that you summarized. She said, it's surprising that David is able to mourn for Saul. Uh, it is surprising because obviously he's had years on the run from Saul. Uh, I also wonder how much was he mourning Saul versus how much was he mourning Jonathan, but you know, different, different story for right, different. Right. Um, <laughs> And some of this too, like when we look at David tearing his clothes and we go, oh my gosh, what an extreme thing. That actually isn't very extreme. So in their context, that would have been very normal. Um, and then there's like a tradition of how they would, um, they would mourn people's death called sitting Shiva. And it was like a part of Jewish tradition. So uh, David was distraught. Everybody around him was distraught, but it wasn't like, oh my gosh, how crazy does that have to be before you start tearing your clothes? Like, not that crazy actually right. so it's good all right so just for you to be thinking about it remember we're going to talk about the who what where and when of the specific passage that we're looking at here so we're going to look at second samuel uh chapter six uh, i'll read these verses um and then you can kind of highlight them lisa and we'll, we'll give people perspective of where we're getting started in this story it says david again gathered all the chosen men of israel thirty thousand. And David arose and went with all the people who were with him from Baal Judah to bring up from there the Ark of God, which is called by the name of the Lord of hosts, who sits enthroned on the cherubim. And they carried the Ark of God on a new cart and brought it out of the house of Abinadab, which was on the hill. And Uzzah and Ahio, the sons of Abinadab, were, were driving the new cart with the Ark of God and Ahio, uh, went before the ark. So uh, obviously we're going to kind of watch a little bit of what's happening underneath as we set up the circumstances of the rest of this story. Uh, but why, like, why is this specifically being called out in the life of David, Lisa? So um, this will be the first time that David is really interacting with the ark. He is recognizing that this is God's presence. And uh, for him to be a good king, he wants God's presence right there with him. Um, and, and at this point, he is trying to move the ark um, to Jerusalem, which is where he was going to set up shop for his reign as king of Israel. Um, <clears throat> and so it had been in this one location for a while, uh, minus the couple uh, moments where it was with the Philistines uh, before that went south real fast for them. Um, and so David is is wanting to move the ark. Um, there's a very specific way that the ark gets moved. And we're going to see um, how that plays out. 
Now, for somebody that doesn't understand, we've talked about this a little bit in the past, but for somebody that doesn't understand kind of the significance of the ark, why was it up in Hebron? What, like, why does it matter that it's coming to Jerusalem? First of all, w- what is the ark? Mm-hmm. Um, and then secondly, why does it matter? Yeah. So the ark was a, it's a box. Um, it was a box and it was, it was very um, ornate. It was uh, covered in gold. It had cherubim um, on top of it that were kind of guarding it inside of it uh, were said to be three things. Let me see if I know a jar of manna um, that God had had used to feed the Israelites when they were wandering in the desert. It had Aaron's staff that used to bud. Um, and then it had the uh, what we call the Ten Commandments. So um, the law that Moses that had been given to Moses from God. Um, so those three things, is that right? Were inside oh, the ark. That's good work. Yeah. Um, and so um, but but there had, there was not a place. So there was not a church. There was not a temple. There was not one location where, um, God's presence, which was said to be, uh, within the ark, uh, that it lived. Right. And so God's presence was really going with the Israelites when they went into battle, they would bring the ark with them. So they would have God's presence with them. Um, and so it was a big deal for them to, to have it uh, and have it close by. Um, but there was not one location. And so David is essentially saying, hey, I know it's been here, um, but but we're going to move it he- here so that it's it's closer to me. Well, and I think, you know, it's, it's so different, right? We talk about the way that the presence of God works today versus the way that it worked in the Old Testament era. There, uh, there were two things that would happen, right? For Israel, they would forget, you know, God was trying to help them understand when you show reverence to the Ark of the Covenant and the guidelines for it, you're showing reverence to me, right? And then really you alluded to it, right? When the Philistines get their hands on the Ark of the Covenant, you had this idea in kind of the ancient world of, hey, like if we can just get the Ark of the Covenant, we have their God. Because they had the, this mistaken idea that like God lived inside of this Ark of the Covenant. And so if they could just get that, then it was like a genie and they would just be able to rub the, you know, rub the lamp and get whatever they wanted. Well. Uh, they get it, and then literally, God's like, "I got this." Israel does not go in. God just sends a bunch of really awful plagues to the Philistines, and they're like, "Oh, never mind." And they bring the Ark of the Covenant back <laughs> to the top, right? And so uh, today, we've talked about this, right? We go from kind of Ark of the Covenant in the Old Testament to Temple, which was always designed to be a temporary manifestation of God's presence, and then when Paul and first Corinthians 6 describes us, you and me, followers of Jesus today. He says, we are actually the temple of the Holy Spirit. So the closest thing to the Ark of the Covenant thousands of years later is not the church building. Uh, It's not some ornate thing somewhere. It's you and me. And and so the implications of that should remind us of like, oh, wait, like I'm, this should change the way that I see my perspective. So um, yeah, it's good. Uh, Cassie said, uh, I thought the Ark was only the Ten Commandments. I'm happy I'm learning this something new. I'm in Leviticus learning about all this. Look at that. Way to get Leviticus is worth it. You can do it. Yes. Um, <laughs> Jennifer said, I hate to admit it, and that I immediately envision Indiana Jones uh, and what that Ark could do. Probably not the best way <laughs> to think about it. I mean, uh, it, is, it is that idea, right? Of yeah. like, oh gosh, you don't want to mess with this. And so you're going to follow all the details and patterns of it. Uh, Liz said, it's interesting to me that David wants the ark near him for his reign as king, but was the ark present when David defeated Goliath? God was with David then, and yet he wants it near him for his kingship. Yeah, I mean, it's a fair point. Even even like on the run, uh, it, he, he was kind of, living life without it. And and we don't, I don't know that we know for that specific battle with the Philistines, but it was pretty common for Israel to actually take the ark with them into yeah. battle. So it very easily could have been there when he took on Goliath. Um, but it wasn't there when he was in the cave, you know, it wasn't there when he needed to survive for years on the run from Saul. But I think there was m- more for David. I think it was, Hey, I'm going to do the things that I need to do to honor God. And this movement really to Jerusalem, you could argue we're still living the implications of this decision from David, even to today. The reason that this is so significant to the Jewish people is because this became so central to their story and what God would do. 
And then at the same time, you know, when you look at uh, followers of Islam, they have their own significance around Jerusalem. And so two different religious groups, one physical location, conflict. Right. And, and, and you made a great point, and I'm not sure everyone knows this, um, that the God of Islam, the God of um, the Jewish people and the Christian God are all the same. Right. I mean, there's the, when when uh, Muslims say uh, Allah, right, that's just God in Arabic. Right. So um, now when we look at the God of um, the Quran, well, we use the same word. It is not actually the same God. Like right. when we when we describe it, the God inside of Islam is a God that wants. Um, uh, I would say that the best way to describe it is. It's a temperamental God whose mind changes, right? Whereas the God of the Bible is the same yesterday, today, and forever. Well, I guess but, what I was saying is they descended from, like the, the belief system descended from. Oh, sure. Yeah, yeah. yeah the one God. But I think it, it's just important to recognize, like, yeah. if you have a Muslim friend, they are working like crazy. Like every other religion outside of biblical Christianity, yeah. they're working like crazy to try to get to God on their own. Whereas within Christianity, it's the only religion that says, instead of you getting to God, God got to yep. you. Instead of you trying to perform, God did what was necessary in his performance to redeem us. So, um, yeah. So as we kind of take a step into this text, when we're beginning to think about the who, what, where, when uh, of this passage, what else stands out to you, Lisa, to help us get to some of those answers? Um, so for me, I think one of the things is just remembering um I learned this a couple years ago and it stands out to me, but when it talks about the Lord of hosts, hosts is just another word for army. Um, and so we see it right here um, that God really is that one that's, that's going with the army. Yeah. Yeah. That's good. And it, it talks about uh, sits enthroned on the cherubim for somebody that doesn't know, you know what that one means? Um, no. So cherubim would be like an angelic reference. You can see some more of it kind of in Isaiah 6, but it's like talking about essentially how this God, this Lord is not sitting on um, earthly authority. He's sitting on heavenly authority. And so, you know, th th and it all goes back to like before Saul, God was like, guys, I'll be your king. I'll be your king forever. I'll never fail you. I'll never go away. I'll last for every generation. Like, just give me a spokesperson and I'll speak to that person. Yeah. Uh, and I'll be your king. And so you see these consistent reference backs, not just in David's kingdom, but as you watch kings, because we're going to see like this really cool thing happen for Israel where they get awesome kings in David and, and, you know, not perfect. Nobody's perfect. But then you even see in Solomon, like some amazing stuff that God does. And then all of a sudden it just becomes this roller coaster. And the constant steady hand is that even in spite of all of that, God continues to reign and rule for Israel and still not give up on it. It's yeah. crazy. Yeah. So uh, Cassie said the fish and the Lotus book is the book you recommended to me to learn more about this. There you go. It's a good book. If you're learning more, if you want to learn more about Islam, that's a great book. Okay. So, if okay. I remember right, that's Robbie Zacharias book. I think so. Um, fantastic. All right. So we, we kind of, we're, we're looking at all of what's happening. We see this priority that's taking place. We see what David is trying to do. Uh, he's trying to kind of begin his reign in a different way, coming to Jerusalem, bringing it work like Elisa alluded to. We're going to see um, really kind of a, a a much different focus on what does God want? Because early on in Saul's ministry and leadership, it was very obvious he did not give a rip about what God wanted or what Samuel wanted. He just didn't care. He just did however he wanted to. And so you see such a stark contrast even here. Where to your point, Saul, like he goes out of his way to make sure that he is following every detail uh, that God sets out, even to the point that he selects this new cart, right? Like he, he's like, we're going to start brand new. I don't think I can replace the ark itself, but I'm going to give it some new wheels. And he puts it on this new cart to bring it uh, to where he is. So uh, as we think about this and kind of what we're talking about, you've heard a little bit about the story, where we are, what's taken place so far in David's life. We're going to talk about who, what, where, and when. Um, you can kind of drop in the comments your thoughts about those. Um, but I'll begin with you, Lisa. Who are we talking about in this passage? Yep. So we've got David, 
who um, has been newly appointed king of Israel. Mm -hmm. Then we've got his uh, 30,000 chosen men of Israel. These would be soldiers. If you were with us on the weekend, uh, the, the crazy part is, you know, it's not that long since David was hiding in a cave with a few hundred guys with whatever weapons they could find. And here you have David with 30,000 like rugged fighting men. Very different look. Yeah. 30,000 men who many of whom had been loyal to Saul chasing David. So, yeah. Oops. <laughs> um, then we've got Abinadab. Oh, that, that's a place. Sorry. Um, Utsa, Utsa, and Ahio. Mm hmm. I have to do some copy and pasting for those names, though. Oh, it is. Abinadam is a person. Oof, that was a close one. It's good. It's good. It's their dad. Yep. Oh, oh not that. Uh, that. We, got, we got it. Yep. And they're, you know, playing key roles um, in this new, you know, kingdom for... David, and not only that, they are uh, kind of key messengers. They're like the Amazon Prime delivery drivers of the Ark in David's early years as king. Right? <laughs> do good. we know? This is just a question. Do we know um, the tribe that Abinadab was from? Uh, I bet we do. I don't know it offhand, but okay. I bet we do. So if you're watching and you want to go chase that down, where yeah. Do if anyone, know? if anyone wants to grab that. That good question. Mm -hmm. That's an important question. I just don't know the answer to it. Yep. Yep. Same. If my mom's watching, Ma, tell us. Just, just comment. She's still scared to comment for some reason. I don't know why. She can do it. I know it's she fine. can. It's fine. Yeah. We're here. It's a safe place. She could send you a text. She could. You could. That's a good point, Mom. You could send me a text. I'll make sure my phone's not on. Do not disturb. It's not. Look at that. So perfect. All right. Uh, Crystal said. Uh, about the ark being returned to Israel. My study Bible says, by bringing the ark to Jerusalem, David demonstrated that both the people of Israel and he as their king were submitted completely to God's rule, unlike Saul's reign. Yeah, that, that contrast we talked about, right? That for Saul early in his um, early in his kingship, it was just easy to go, you know what, I'm gonna kind of do this my way. Uh, I know you want me to sacrifice this way, God. I know you want me to wait till this happens, but... I'm actually going to just kind of do it my way and uh, yeah. did not go well, did not go well. And no. we talked to, and, and I think that, it, I mean, it's a lesson that David had to learn and thankfully David did learn it. It's a, it's a lesson that Saul never learned, but we talked about it this weekend, that the right thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing that just changing the timeline of what we think we get or get to do or deserve or should have, or should do just changing the timeline can change things dramatically. Right. Yep. Um, yeah, and then Cassie gave us the who as well. Thank you so much, Cassie. That's awesome. Um, Becky asks, do we know who the author is here since Samuel died in 1 Samuel 1? That's a great, or in, in, yeah. Do you have any ideas about authorship here for 2 Samuel, man? No. <laughs> <laughs> we don't know. Well, uh, it remains a mystery, as does the author of 1 Samuel. So even though both of these books are named after Samuel, uh, the thought is that he probably didn't author either one of them. And if he authored part of the first one, he definitely didn't author the second one. As it's kind of like the same. I mean, you know, there, there is definitely some controversy. There are people that think Samuel authored a huge portion of first Samuel. And then just like it changed hands at the end. Uh, Cause the same thing happened in the Pentateuch for Moses um, because Moses is attributed have, as having written some of that. Um, like all of that, but then obviously his own death is recorded in it. And so he probably didn't write that part. Um, but we've talked about kind of the nature of Hebrew scriptures is a little, it's not a little, it's a lot different than our new Testament books because new Testament books were written about usually a moment in time. Whereas when we're reading this, I mean, we're reading about decades, yep. decades of time in the life of Israel. And so uh, a lot of this stuff, while it was getting chronicled, maybe within, um, you know, a scribe for the king or within David's own writings or for Samuel, like you have oral tradition that's getting passed on one to one to one. And because it's so much history, uh, there's not really a way 
that one individual could have lived through all of it and written it down the way that we see in the New Testament. And when you think about it in the New Testament, there's really no book, maybe other than Hebrews, where it's not a direct, well, I guess Luke is this way as well, uh, where there's, it's not like a direct eyewitness account that we're reading about, right? So mm-hmm. even the epistles, when we look at letters, um, Paul is referencing a moment as he writes to a group of people in that same moment. Um, so it is not as satisfying. We would love to know who wrote it. We, we don't get to know. So, um, yep. And then, uh, yep. Crystal said where Baal of Judah is, uh, where they are headed to Jerusalem. Right. Uh, so there's kind of a, a from and to of this that's helpful. Um, So um, it's good. Uh, and then uh, Cassie said, Levite. Look at that. I've been a dad. Levite. Thanks so much. But Peggy says Judah. So oh. Oh. I think I think in my own in my own research that I did really quick here. Um, oh, real time. See. So there, there's just not a good. Um, we don't really know. So the the town where he was from was in Judah. Yeah. Uh, so the thought is that possibly from Judah, um, yeah. but because of his relationship to the Ark, typically that would have been yeah. a Levite. Yep. Yeah. So a little bit unknown. Interesting. That's good to know. Uh, Vicky said, "What David and those he gathered were bringing the Ark of God back to Jerusalem, the house of Benedict." Yep. Absolutely. Uh, yeah, Sarah, good question, right? Uh, this, this is a little bit of what we're just alluding to. The question was, it been to have a priest? I thought only the priests were supposed to move the ark. So typically it would have been within um, kind of the Levite tribe. They were the ones that were sp- specifically selected to be able to do this. The, the dance is we don't get the full story, right? So anytime that we're reading about this, it's hard to know, is everyone in the scene being described here or are there other people as well? Uh, yeah, you're right. There needed to be a priest there, but could there have been a priest that was there kind of honoring that aspect of the guidelines for the Ark? And these ones are named specifically as people that made sure, we just don't, we just don't know the answer. Yep. So, um, yep. Uh, Peggy says, my Bible states, this book was named after the prophet who anointed David and guided him in living for God. Yep. And that's, I mean, you're going to see that. So when you look in your Bible, one of the things that's interesting is uh, first and Samuel are two books but they're not really two books. They're actually one. And so they were broken up for our benefit. Um, and really not even necessarily for ours. They were kind of broken up for the benefit of like back in the day, these were essentially, these were scrolls. And so if you would have had first and second Samuel as a single scroll, uh, it just wouldn't have been functional. And so they broke it out for that reason. But the reason they're both called Samuel is because they were originally one document. Same thing if you keep going into first and second Kings, um, and this is really the history portion uh, that we get to see for Israel in this era where they go from um, uh, this kind of theocracy to a monarchy. Well, and they really break it into before David was king and after he was king. Right. Yep. Uh, and then Sarah said, could the author uh, have been like Samuel? Um, yeah, I mean, we, we just don't know the answer. Could it have been another prophet? Maybe. But I mean, it's definitely not Samuel at this point because he's no longer alive. So when she finishes that thought with Samuel scribe, potentially, oh. um, but still, Phil was talking about it took place over so much time. Um, because if you when you start in First Samuel, it it's before Samuel's even born, and so there's the there's this huge amount of time. I just don't know that it could have been one person. And I mean, what's so different for us culturally that makes these studies hard and makes it frustrating for us is that we're used to reading about an event one time and kind of filing it away within oral tradition, uh, within Judaism. Like if you have that like old person in your life, you know, like there are people in my life, they're amazing. I'm not going to say their name because I don't want to embarrass them. Uh, But it's like just some of the most godly people I've ever met. They're in their 80s. And one of them, he will start a story and it's like, oh, I've heard you tell me this story 30 times. Like I, I've heard this story so many times, but out of respect, I'm not like, Hey, I've heard this one before. I just listened to it again. Right. That was actually kind of codified within Jewish culture. So you would sit around 
and like how you tell your kids, you know, bedtime stories, you would sit around your entire life as a Jewish person and you would just hear the same stories told over and over and over and over again. So when we talk about oral tradition, that's why it could get handed from one generation to the other, because these stories were so ingrained into the regular culture of Jews. Well, and we talked about when we were studying Paul's letters um, right before this, we talked about how Paul had memorized what we now call the Old Testament. So not only did he know them, but he had memorized them, which is exactly what oral tradition was teaching um, Jewish people of this time was, you didn't just know these stories, you didn't kind of know the, the bones of it. You knew the details. Right. Yep, absolutely. So uh, and then when we think about when here, some of you have commented this or something about this, right? We're talking about around uh, a thousand, around a thousand BC. Um, so th that is important because David is going to be kind of this really important line from within which Jesus would be born, right? And so you watch the lineage take place. And when you think about it, like thousand years, we're actually sort of closing in here, right? And so Israel's got a whole lot of history to live, um, but the timeline is, is going to get a lot more condensed. Like you're going to see action happen from here. Even if you were to continue to study in your Old Testament, the Hebrew scriptures become a lot more detailed. Uh, because you have these voices of the prophets that grow up even on the other side of these kingly reigns. Super helpful. So here's what we're going to do. Uh, we are going to spend some time talking about application, right? And just a reminder, when we look at narrative, the best application, the application that the author intends for us to have comes in the lowering tension of a particular story. So obviously today we're talking about exposition. It's a lot of kind of nerdy what's under the hood stuff that helps us study for the rest of the week, which is super helpful. You guys have done great. Um, but, but there is also application that we can use because we can learn from all that exposition that we just did, how we apply it to us. So I would encourage you, if there's something you're thinking about, something you're um, applying or wondering about from this, drop it in the comments. For you, Lisa, as we reflect on this, what are some application points that are sitting with you from this text? Yeah, one of the notes that I read um, says, as a true theocratic king, David wished to acknowledge the, the, the Lord's kingship and rule over both himself and the people by restoring the ark to a place of prominence in the nation. So for me, it's how am I honoring God's uh, kingship over me? Yeah. Or am I kind of maintaining that posture of Saul where I'm trying to be the boss? Yeah, that's good. We've, we've talked about this before. It's it's a Keller quote, right? That if, um, if the God you worship never disagrees with you, you don't worship the God of the Bible, you worship an idealized version of yourself. And I think that Saul always wanted to worship an idealized version of himself. And I think we see in David, especially early in his leadership, Somebody that just said, like, God, I don't know if I always get it, but I always have confidence in you. I'm always going to err on the side of doing it the way you've said that it needs to be done. And um, I think that is incredibly important for us to have as a framework for how we think and believe. I heard someone tell me one time or ask me one time, um, do I worship Jesus as much as Savior as I do as Lord? Because Jesus is both Lord and Savior. Yeah. Um, and that has that has stuck with me for a long time because I definitely yeah. love the savior part. But right. right. I wrestle with a little bit more. Yeah, that's good. And there's, I mean, there's even like a, um, there's a discussion called Lordship Salvation, right? Which is this big theological discussion that basically means, are you saved? Like, are you actually going to heaven in a relationship with God? If you just kind of pray a prayer, um, but God doesn't get control of your life. Um, or do you actually have to submit and surrender to him? And, and I don't know. I mean, I think from my perspective, um, I think it's hard to shake the connection between those two things. But I also think the implications of you believe in your heart and confess with your mouth that Jesus is Lord, we say uh, there, there are implications to once I do that for real, <laughs> it's progressive. It's not going to be the next day. Everything's all better. But like he is as a part of my sanctification, this ongoing work of God in my life. It is going, he is going to, in a healthy way, take greater and greater leadership in my life. That's good. 
Uh, we've got some application stuff here. Uh, Cassie said, how in the world did he remember all the measurements and intricate uh, laws like for skin diseases and how to present sacrifices? Like what? Yeah, well, that's thankfully those things were written down. Um, and so, you know, you had you had some of the oral tradition, but then the law was getting passed down. It wasn't necessarily codified. Um, but then the other thing you have to understand is that for significant parts of Israel's history, there would be parts of the law, like you're looking at Leviticus, there would be parts of the law that they would just completely disregard, like for generations. Yep. And then they'd be like, oh, yeah, there was one time where literally they had a king who actually rediscovered the Hebrew scriptures. Like they had forgotten about it. It was like, oh, shoot. They got lost. This? Yeah. Like, what's this book over here? Like, these are some helpful scrolls. And it led to this incredible revival for Israel to be able to do that. So it's, I mean, just because they're there doesn't mean they always obeyed them. There are things, actually, there are things in the Hebrew scriptures when we look at the law that they actually, we don't have any evidence that they ever practiced. So one of them is the year of Jubilee. Uh, that like the, every 50th year, there were like a whole bunch of things that basically God wanted a reset, a reset for the land, a reset for the nation, a reset for debt, a reset for a whole bunch of things. And we don't have any evidence that we know of that Israel actually ever practiced that. It was like, oh, that's <laughs> never thought about that. Maybe next time. <laughs> <laughs> As he said, application, how am I leading a life of Christ like Abinadab led the cart? Also, uh, where should I play the background uh, in my life? And I think, you know, being able to say, God, am I willing to, you know, like David, am I willing to reset and put you at the beginning of this conversation, at the beginning of this priority, um, or am I continuing to try to place myself there a little bit like you were talking about, Lisa? I think that is so central in the contrast that we see between Saul and David. That's great. Any other thoughts as we wrap up day one, Lisa, from this passage or ways we can be thinking about as we think about the rest of this week? Yeah, I'm not sure exactly how to word it, but something in the motivation, um, and I don't know that it's necessarily an application thing. Maybe this isn't, maybe this doesn't go here, but um, I know J I know David's motivation was pure, but it's almost like his excitement got in the way. Maybe it's pulling in what we talked about this weekend about the, the right thing thing at the wrong time is the wrong thing. I mean, I think that's kind of where we're heading here. Sure. Yep. Yeah. I think there's, there's absolutely some of that, that we're about to watch. There is no doubt about it. So yeah. it's good. Well, Hey guys, this has been a super helpful conversation. I know that it feels different when we study narrative because at the beginning you're like, wait, where's the story? And it's like, we're going to get there. Just be patient this work, well, when you do your own study, doesn't need to take necessarily an entire day. It's about implementing the, the rhythm and routine of making sure we're going beneath the surface um, to figure out, okay, what does it look like for me to be faithful in the way that David was, not in the way that Saul was, and then we'll be able to kind of see how this shows up from there. So uh, just before we go, just a reminder, if you are uh, somebody that needs help in this season or know somebody that needs help for or is this uh, kind of extension of how we're doing that marketplace just got moved actually uh, into a different room in our building last week, but uh, they are primed and ready to go to continue to serve our community each week. Uh, we are still taking donations for that. Really appreciate the way that you guys continue to show up and make every week possible, whether you're serving, you're giving, you're donating. Um, and if you want to help, you can find out more information about how to do that there as well. But thanks so much for joining us. Appreciate you guys. Before we go, I'm going to pray for us. And uh, hopefully the rest of the day is not, okay, God, see you tomorrow, the rest of the day, but this is a jump off point for you to continue to spend time with him. Let's pray. God, thank you. Thank you for the chance that we've had to be able to dig into your words and uh, God, this incredible moment in history where we watch how Israel had waited for so many years for a kind of king they wanted. Um, and now they're going to get the king they need. And so, uh, God, I pray that we would learn in the days ahead about what that looks like. And even in, in David's own um, mistake, some of the cautionary tale of what it can look like to start well and end poorly. I pray that you would uh, be in the details of our study this week, that you would help us to pull from it the things that are going to make a real difference in our life. Uh, and God, we pray for our world. We pray for um, the things that we continue to monitor with COVID and pray that um, the, the mortality rate would continue to drop. Hospitalization rates would continue to drop even as things begin to kind of come back.